Cool. And you can start the recording. All right. Well, welcome to those of you who are online. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. So enjoy just a couple minutes of my chatting with others since I'll be the only one you can hear. Well, we'll see. Where did Jacob go? <laughs> oh, okay. He's like, nah, I'm out. He's like, I'm going to watch it online. Yeah, right. So he's just like in the back watching it online. <laughs> Not that fast, yeah. I know there's like, so there's several families that registered. Like there's a family in Texas that's watching it. There's some people in Michigan that are watching it. South Carolina, I think. The mic. Yeah, I, it wasn't working. I was like, okay, let's try switching the batteries and see if that helps. I think it was a bad cable. You what? How did you embarrass yourself in front of an old guy? I am not that old. <laughs> did you actually say that? You just look like someone who would be here a lot? No, I didn't say that. Oh. So you embarrass yourself twice, <laughs> the same guy. Yeah. I'm sorry? Yeah. I am old. All right, I'm giving it 30 more seconds, then we're going to get started. Yeah, I'm sure there will be quite a few people that trickle in. Yeah, Thursday nights are just rough, but it was the only night that worked. So, yeah, yeah. Like I've said from the beginning, I don't know how many people will be in here. It's more so the video that we're trying to do well. And uh, the more people that are here, the better for me. I do a lot better with people, personally, than I do just like, I wouldn't be able to just like stand here in an empty room and just do this. So, all right, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you guys all for being here. For those of you who are online, hopefully you're able to, to utilize this video and learn a lot. Um, I said this last week, but just kind of a recap of the structure of the way the class is going to run. Um, it will be more of a lecture style class focusing on apologetics, which is a defense of the Christian faith. Um, apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means to give a defense or a reason. So obviously, as we're applying that to the Christian faith, it is a defense for what we believe. Um, so throughout this 10-week course, we'll be talking a lot about how we defend the Christian faith and the questions that arise from those who, who ask questions about what the Bible is, what we believe, and, and try to discredit it. Um, so this week, we'll be talking a lot about what's called bibliography. And bibliography is the study of the physical Bible. Um, so it's a study of the history of the authorship of the Bible. It's the study of the, the books that make up the Bible. It's the study of what was passed down throughout all of those years since its authorship. Um, and that is one of the areas when it comes to the study of texts of antiquity, um, where the Bible actually matches up so well against any other world religion. Um, that is where a lot of other thoughts and worldviews really start to crumble is when you start to question um, some of the different study of their holy works, um, whether it be translational stuff throughout the years, whether it be um, the way in which it was passed down, whether it be um, you know, any sorts of other nature of the passing of those, that language and those words, the Bible actually has overwhelmingly impressive evidence, which we'll talk about tonight, of, of just authority in that we can trust in what it says, both from a physical standpoint, which also leads obviously to a, a um, religious standpoint and why we can put our faith in what the Bible teaches. Um, obviously, the Bible is the book that outlines the Christian faith. When we talk about the Christian faith, Christian just means like a little Christ. It actually started as a derogatory term in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. Um, they came back. Let me see if I can do this without a mouse. does not look like it. There we go. I fixed it. Um, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for the, a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. 
Um, and obviously that was in the book of Acts, I meaning that was almost 2,000 years ago that people who follow after Christ are called Christians, which at its core literally just means little Christ. Um, because the Christians were known to, to act like this random dude that they hailed as a savior named Jesus Christ. So that's where the term Christian comes from. And a Christian is anyone who's following after the God of the Bible. So Christians believe in the Bible. And historically, there's been a lot of groups that have claimed the term Christian that definitely don't fall into this category. Um, but for our purposes throughout this class, when we say Christian, we're talking about those who are part of the family of God that through saving faith have come to know Jesus Christ as their Savior um, and the extension of that, which is massive. And we'll talk some about the historical movement of the Christian movement as part of our apologetic study way later on, but it's pretty incredible just how global the Christian faith has become throughout the entirety of the world. So obviously, the cornerstone of what we believe is all in the Bible, which is why the study of the Bible, the study of bibliology is so important. Because if we're going to trust our entire lives, our entire worldview, our entire faith to this book, uh, we, we should be able to study its origins, study and, and make sure that we know that we can trust it on different levels. Um, so the study of the Bible, the Word of God, because we believe it is the inspired Word of God. So what about the Bible? What do we know about the Bible? Well, we know that there's 66 books in the Bible. It was written in about two or three languages. Um, by more than 40 authors over a 1,500-year period, and it all contains one message of salvation. The reason we say two to three languages, the scriptures themselves were written in two languages, but Jesus likely spoke Aramaic, um, not Arabic, Aramaic, which was a, a language locally in that area of the world. Um, so many of his sayings would have been in Aramaic, but translated into Greek, which would ultimately be what was written. So two to three languages, that is why that is present, because the Old Testament is all written in Hebrew, and the New Testament predominantly in Greek, um, translated from Jesus' teachings that were in, most likely in Aramaic. How incredible is that? That as we're looking at the Bible, as we're studying the Bible, I want you guys to recognize and remember that all throughout the entirety of the Bible, it all contains that one message of salvation. It is unified. Um, and if you think about this, you can't even have a book with two or three authors that doesn't have discrepancies. Um, and to give an example of this, you can't have movies either. If, if any of you have ever seen the three newest Star Wars movies, they had two different directors. They had a, an original director, then they got a new director for the second, I think it's episode, so it's eight, nine, and ten, right? No, seven, eight, nine, thank you. So for seven, they had a director, for eight, they had a new director, and then for nine, they had a, the first director came back, and it was a train wreck. The whole thing was a disaster. I mean, Disney had to go so far to decanonize those movies um, because the first director had a storyline in mind. The second director was like, nah, we're going to go this way. And then the, third, the, the first director again was like, no, I like my original plan. And as you watch the movies, you can actually see like, the storyline change and then try to go back, but it doesn't work. We can't even have two authors that speak one message, let alone the Bible that was written over such a long period of time, over 1,500 years. There's a lot of culture that falls into that. And culture changes throughout time. And as culture changes throughout time, you have on a human perspective, the way that we view things culturally changes. Um, and so that message will often change. I mean, even just look at the United States of America. Um, I could, I mean, even when I was in high school, just to give a, a very real front example, when I was in high school, and I'm only 27, I, I've only, I haven't even been out of high school 10 years. We teased that maybe someday in our lifetime, homosexuality, marriage, homosexual, same-sex marriages would be legalized in our country. We couldn't even fathom a day that that would be possible in our lifetime. And then it literally happened in five years from the time that I graduated. Um, so even in our own culture, things change quickly. Yet for the Jews, even throughout that 1,500-year gap of cultural change, there was a coherent message um, within the Bible and that message is what we believe in. We believe in the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ that the Bible teaches in so many different areas that is all unified. And we're going to talk about that. And we'll also talk tonight about some of the arguments that are brought up against the Bible. Um, and I'm going to be honest with you. I did a lot of research when I was first studying for apologetics. And I went through and I literally Googled arguments against the Bible. I didn't find a lot of good ones. Um... And I, I was kind of expecting more 
just because so many people will try to bring up things in jest, but on an academic level, there aren't very many well thought out arguments against the Bible because the Bible doesn't leave room for it. And we'll talk about some of those things as we get to them. So we believe one big thing, obviously huge, the Bible is inspired by God. Um, most of my verses that we'll be using, unless otherwise noted, are going to be from the New, Eng uh, New International Version, uh, the NIV from the 2012 or 11 or whatever it was. Um, but in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that word there, God breathed, many other translations will use the word inspired. God spoke truth, and that led to the scriptures that we have today. They were all written by men, which First Peter goes into a little bit more. First Peter chapter 1, verse 21. For prophecy never had its own origin in the human will. But prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So you have God, who is the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all things, who spoke through holy people and through the power of his Holy Spirit gave them revelation that they wrote down and it was preserved to our modern day Bible. Um, so at the core of what we believe, we believe that the Bible, the 66 canon Bible of scripture that we have, is from God. It is inspired by God. It is preserved by God. Um, and that's, that's the cornerstone of what we believe in that. So let's talk about a breakdown of the Bible here for a little bit. How is our current Bible set up? Um, obviously, most people are familiar with the Old and the New Testaments. A little more specifically, it's actually, um, if you want to be a little more accurate in what we call them, it's actually the Hebrew Bible and then the New Covenant. And even the New Covenant is more like the, the law-fulfilled covenant. Um, it's not a New Covenant as much as it is just the fulfillment of what God had promised in the Old Testament. What we call it the Old and New Testament, because I am culturally an American um, using English, that's what I typically will call it, even though I'm trying to break that habit and call it the Hebrew Bible and the New Covenant. Um, but throughout the, the class, you'll hear predominantly the Old and the New Testament. The Old Testament is broken down into five different categories. And those categories are based differently in our version of the Bible than it is in the Hebrew Bible. Now, the Old Testament um, is the Hebrew Bible. It's all the same books. So the same canon of Scripture that Jesus would have used in his lifetime in the Hebrew Bible is the exact same as our Old Testament, but they categorized the books differently. Our books were categorized about a thousand years after the life of Christ within those councils that we'll talk about a little bit later with the canon of Scripture being developed. Um, and they put not only the categories together, which they were Western thinkers. The way that we have our Bible today was Western thought. So it's linear in thought, um, which I'll define that in just a second. But around that same time is also when they added in the chapters and the verses. It was not the original authors that did, you know, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Um, Peter wasn't sitting there writing in the chapters and verses. Those were added later, and I'm thankful they were added later, but they don't necessarily coincide with the breaks that the author intended. Um, so that's something to remember as you study your Bible. Those chapter breaks are very, very helpful in us being able to find and memorize Scripture. It does not mean those were intended by the original authors. Hello. Feel free to come on in, sit down. We're rolling through bibliology. Um, yeah. As we have more tricklers. Oh. All right. So the Old Testament, the five category. Oh, excuse me. I'm going to define this too because I just talked about this. When we talk about linear and cyclical thought within the dominant philosophies of the world, those are the two main viewpoints of how the earth historically and modernly function. Western thinkers think linearly. We think beginning, middle, and end, meaning there's a timeline. And we think of things as in a timeline. Eastern civilizations often think in the world, uh, of the world cyclically, Meaning, you know, that kind of idea, what goes around, comes around. But they also think about that historically. Um, in fact, there are several authors in the Bible that think really cyclically. John is really the best example. He not only wrote the Gospel of John, but the, the letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And John was very cyclical in the way that he thought. Which is why, from a Western perspective, we're like, that's not in the same order in the book of John as it is in the book of Matthew, the way he tells the Gospel. Well, that's because John wasn't thinking linearly. 
He was thinking thematically what were important in the life of Jesus, not the order that it happened. Um, and that oftentimes will confuse us in our Western mindset. Um, but the way that our Bible was constructed was linear because the way that we currently have the Bible structured um, in those categories that we're about to go into is based on our linear thought. Now, that's not good, bad, or indifferent. That's really just cultural. And even the way that we categorize the books of the Bible don't change the meaning of what's said in it. But here's how our Bible in America is laid out. So the first five books of the Bible are what we call the Torah. They're the books of the law. That's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Um, all five of those books were written by Moses, who was a prophet of God, who led the people of Israel out of Egypt. He is the one that was given the law um, that then the Jews lived by. And one of the things that most confuses people is the, the law itself. Like, why is it that certain things are allowed in the Old Testament and then not in the New Testament? Um, well, part of apologetics is defending, an art, you know, defending the thoughts on those things. As we look at the law, again, the first five books of the Bible, even within the law that was given to the Jews, there's three categories. The first category is the moral law. And the moral law is anything that's against the nature and character of God. Uh, for example, the Ten Commandments falls into the moral law. It is against the nature and the character of God to murder, to steal, to disobey your parents, to covet things, to worship gods that are not God, uh, to take the Lord's name in vain. Those are all moral law, meaning those are universal. All people in all places at all times. The second category of the breakdown of the law um, is the ceremonial law. Now, ceremonial law would be certain steps that were necessary to take to be ceremonially clean. Uh, for example, something in a modern day context, we're about to have the Olympics coming up here in just a couple of months. And there are certain things that always happens at the Olympics, like they light the torch. Um, that's the Olympics, right? I'm not losing my mind. Yeah, okay. So they light the torch and that's a ceremonial thing they do in representation of something bigger than just a flame that's burning. It's a representation of the unity of the world, right? Same is true with the Jews. A lot that was given within the law was how to be ceremonially clean before God. That specifically is what Jesus fulfilled at the cross. No longer was there ceremonial cleanliness that is necessary to be right with God, um, which, by the way, the Jews also did in faith. It's always been by faith that people were made right with God. So we no longer needed to do those acts of the ceremonial cleanliness, the sacrifices that were needed to be done, the specific washings that needed to be done, um, the Holy of Holies uh, was, was open to all humanity when Jesus died on the cross, and that was fulfilled by the work of, of Christ. And so oftentimes, people will use the argument of, you know what? Christ fulfilled the law, therefore I can do whatever I want, I can sin in any way that I want, um, and, and that doesn't upset God. Well, Paul answers that one pretty clearly and easily. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, he says, Shall we sin, therefore, that grace may abound? And he's like, heck no, bro. Um, that's the Brandon Standard Version. We call it the BSV. Um, he actually says, like, God forbid, different translations do it a little differently, but it's all like, no. That is not the case because Paul is referencing the moral law, and the moral law of God is universal. The ceremonial law of God was fulfilled. Then you have a third category, and the third category is the civil law. Um, now, if you're a criminal justice major in school or if you, you've studied criminal justice, civil law is one of the principles in American society we really uphold um, because civil law is the law of a nation and the law of a nation for example in America there's certain things you can and cannot do even if they're a little funky for example uh, we have a thing called the FDA and restaurants cannot sell things that are not FDA approved that's civil law um, you know there's medications um, and if something's not FDA approved oftentimes <laughs> um, those things can't be sold and then hopefully by 2023, I think, is when the data set for the COVID vaccine to be um, FDA approved. But at this point, it's not. Um, but that's civil law. Other civil laws that we have, do you guys know in Alabama, you're not allowed to, to bathe your donkey on the second Thursday of the month? Some crazy, there's some crazy state laws, right? Um, so people will look at the Bible and they'll be like, hey, <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> Hey, we're also not in Alabama. Colorado has some weird laws too, though, actually. Um, like, for example, uh, speed limits. That is civil law. There's nothing moral about going 65 and a 55, uh, but you'll still get a ticket. So civil law is set up to help a society 
function to the best of its ability. There's a reason that we have codes in the United States for construction. There's a reason we have laws for how we drive on the roads. Um, those are all civil laws. Well, the Jews had that because the Jews were set up by the law as a theocracy, meaning that they were under the leadership of God as their ruler. Um, and because of that, the, the law, as it's written, the first five books of the Old Testament includes civil law. So people, I've been asked this before, is like, hey, how come it says in the Old Testament in Leviticus, like, you can't eat crawfish in the same, you know, and then a few sentences later says, you can't have homosexual relationships. Isn't that a little crazy? Well, yeah, unless you start to learn and understand and study what is being said. It is part of the civil law where you can't eat crawfish. And, and in case you guys didn't know this, crawfish is actually really bad for you um, because they're bottom feeders. Everything that is listed in the, the Jewish law of what you can and cannot eat on a civil level are things that are not good for you, including pork. Pork is actually really bad for you. Um, though, I mean, brats taste really good. So, um, I mean, here's the best example. We'll talk about this later. In the Old Testament, part of the civil law is not to eat bats because bats carry diseases that are bad for society. Lo and behold, that's kind of the predominant theory of where COVID-19 came from. Um, it's because someone ate a bat. That was part of the civil law that encouraged the society to be able to function better and more properly. Um, we live in the United States. We don't follow England's civil law. We don't follow Uganda's civil law. We don't follow Russia's civil law. We don't go to Europe, wherever they drive on the wrong hand side of the road and tell them they're doing it wrong because that's not a moral issue. That's a civil issue. And those are the three breakdowns of the law within the Bible. Um, so again, that first category is the, the Torah or the law, um, and that outlines the laws that were given to the Jews, both the moral laws, the ceremonial laws, and the civil laws. Um, one key with the moral law, because sometimes it's hard, it's like, where's that line of how do we know what was moral law and what was civil law um, or even ceremonial law? Ultimately, most things that we attribute to being moral law were repeated in the New Testament. Um, so for example, one of the ones that's brought up a lot is the tattoo issue of, you know, in the, the law, it's talked about how, you know, you shouldn't get ink put to you with a needle, I think is how it's written. Um, that was never repeated in the new Testament. I mean, I have a tattoo. I got my wedding ring tattooed underneath my wedding ring. Um, so clearly I don't think it's a moral issue, right? I would actually put that one more under ceremonial slash civil law for two reasons. One, um, the way that they did tattoos back then would have been very intentionally in the worship of a false god. And so with their society around them, there's certain things that you shouldn't do because it'll be attributed to the worship of a false god. So the Jews being set apart civilly are able to come back and be like, you know what, I don't have any tattoos because I'm set apart for God. And there's times in different societies and cultures where that might be wise for Christians not to get tattoos, but that also doesn't mean it's part of the moral law. Um, so that's kind of where that line usually is. And, and the tattoo one is really the best example. Um, and even the dietary laws that were given to the Jews as part of their civil law, um, that was taken away, quote unquote, from the moral law when Peter in the book of Acts has a dream. And in this dream, a sheet descends from heaven and a voice from heaven says, go, Peter, take and eat. And it was all unclean things. And Peter's like, nah, dude, I've never eaten anything unclean in my life. Three times that happens. And then right after that dream takes place, he goes and meets this guy named Cornelius, who was the first Gentile. Um, there was a public example of salvation to the Gentiles. And so we'll talk about that more later when we talk some of the history of the early church and apologetics down the road. Um, but that is, is given as a literally spelled out reason of like the dietary restrictions were part of the civil law, not the moral law. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Any questions on that? Anyone online, Willem? Questions? Cool. The second category of how our Bible is broken down in the Old Testament is the books of history. And those books of history, we're going to come at it from a perspective of, and this is what I truly believe, and I, you know, this is some of we're going to talk about apologetics, the defense of what we believe. I mean, I can defend this statement. I believe these things literally historically happened. Um, and those are the books of Joshua through Esther. So, after the books of the law, you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. After Deuteronomy, Moses dies. Joshua becomes their new leader and leads the Jews into the promised land of Canaan. They establish a kingdom. Um, and in this, this kingdom is divided into different tribes. And it talks extensively about the history 
of these Jewish kingdoms that come from that. Uh, the book of Judges outlines leaders that rose up out of this theocracy that didn't always run well um, because people fell into breaking the law of God, meaning society ended up falling into chaos. Uh, we've seen that here recently. When people break civil law, society descends into chaos. We see that extensively for the Jews. Um, something happens where God brings judgment against them. A leader rises up to bring them back to God. And then you see that restoration of the people several times. So that's Joshua is the story of them developing that kingdom initially. The book of Judges outlines that period of time that judges were ruling in Israel. And it was very tribal. Um, the tribes were pretty isolated in their leadership also. And, and that led to some conflict, even internally for the Jews, oftentimes in that period. Well, all of a sudden you get to the book of 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles. And it starts to outline the history of the actual kingdom of Israel. Because you have the Jews are asking for a king and Samuel, who was a prophet, was like, nah, dude, a king is going to suck. He's going to come and take your daughters as uh, wives. He's going to make your son serve in the military. He's going to tax you big time. And it's not going to be fun for you. And they were like, well, we want a king. All of our neighbors have kings. We think it'd be cool. So they get Saul as a king. Um, and that leads to eventually David becoming king. Now, the line of David is super significant because the line of David, um, both historically and, and by the promises of God, would be the line that the kingdom that Jesus will reign and will be established forever. Because God promised David that through your line, there will be no end. Um, and we'll get to that too when we get to the New Testament and the Gospels um, really strongly bring that full circle. So those books of history outline that period of time. And it outlines an extensive period of time, about a thousand years roughly, in the books of history in the Old Testament. And it ends with the book of Esther. Because it goes through all that different historical background. Then you have the, the kingdom of Judah, I'm sorry, Israel splits into two because there's a civil war because Solomon's son did some dumb things, but it was also punishment for some dumb things Solomon did um, in turning his heart away from the Lord. His son didn't listen to wisdom. Um, so the book of Proverbs is actually, majority of it is written to, which is in the next category I'll get to, but um, a majority of the book of Proverbs, which is wisdom, is written from Solomon to his son, who we know from history didn't listen to his dad's wisdom. The kingdom ended up splitting. You had the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, um, which also ends up becoming extensively significant because the northern kingdom of Israel uh, actually gets destroyed. It gets taken over by the Assyrians. All records of the northern tribes of Israel have been lost. Every single one. And there's no way to prove the lineage of the northern tribes of Israel. That's why they call them the ten lost tribes. Is because when they got taken over by the Assyrians, their kingdom was never reestablished. They lost all of that. However, the southern kingdom of Judah, which the, uh, the predominant tribe in the southern kingdom was the tribe of Judah, which is why it's called the kingdom of Judah, right? It was the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, both significant in the line and lineage of Jesus Christ. Both of their gene genealogical records were preserved um, when the Babylonians invaded. And that was a huge part of their history. And they went into what's called a 70-year captivity, which are all found in the books of history. The Persians end up taking over the, the Babylonian Empire. And when the Persians take over the Babylonian Empire, they allow the Jews to go home. And throughout that time period, you have the book of Esther, which is the final book of history. And Esther talks about a time, it actually is outlining the king, is likely King Xerxes, uh, who's the same guy who invaded Greece in the movie 300. For those of you who've heard me talk about this before, if I were in Greece at that time, I would have rebelled against the Greeks and joined the Persians. The Persians historically were one of the best empires to be conquered by. Um, and the Greeks were awful, terrible human beings who were enslavers and rapists and, and pedophiles and awful human beings. And we try to glorify them for some reason when really the Persians, it would have been good for Greece if the Persians had taken over. Historical battle that doesn't really matter to what we're talking about. But the book of Esther is Esther is chosen as queen and saves the Jews from annihilation. Um, and that is the last book of history until the New Testament. But that's about a thousand years that is covered um, by these books of history. The third category are the books of poetry. And very similar to American, well, English poetry, there are certain nuances to poetry in the Hebrew language that attribute to make it poetry. Um, 
Can anyone tell me right now in American English poetry, what makes something poetry? I didn't hear it, but it's rhyme scheme. If something rhymes, that's how we determine whether or not it's poetry. And oftentimes it's also by the meter in which it's written. So you have iambic pentameter and other things like that. I will tell you this, English is terrible to translate its poetry. Could you imagine trying to translate Dr. Seuss into Spanish? It would just look absolutely ridiculous because English poetry really only works in English. Hebrew poetry was not that way. Hebrew poetry was thematic, meaning it would, it would take a theme and it would use it cyclically. There's that word again, right? Because the Jews were often a cyclical thought process people. And it would take a theme and cyclically use that theme within the structure of its poetry. Um, and Hebrew poetry is perfect to be translated into thousands of languages around the world and still be fully understood. It doesn't mean it's fully understood to the breadth of the beauty that was originally written, but it's still able, I mean, we can go read in the book of Psalms right now, and there is so much beauty in the books of Hebrew poetry. Um, but the books of poetry start in the book of Job and go through the Song of Songs. Um, there's also Lamentations, which is, you have Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Lamentations. Lamentations is oftentimes grouped with the books of poetry. So why on earth someone messed that up and put them in the books of prophecy? I don't know, but it's more of a book of poetry. Um, and Hebrew poetry is just beautiful. When you go and look, you have the Psalms, which are oftentimes prayers of joy for, for who God is. Oftentimes they're prayers of questioning God, of why God would allow things to happen. Um, you have the book of Proverbs, which are wise sayings that have been heralded all over the world from all different perspectives as, as just in, immense wisdom. Um, you also have the book of, of Song of Songs, which is a beautiful expression of the type of love that we're able to have sexually with spouses um, as God intended it to be that way uh, with the gift that he gave us in sexual intercourse when done properly with how God intended it to be, right? Um, but then you also have a book like Ecclesiastes or, or Lamentations, whichever one of the two where Solomon is writing and he says, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. So here's this poetry at the end of this guy's life where he's like, hey, it's like everything I did in my life was useless. What was the point? And then he goes through that thought process for the several chapters. Um, and it's all just this beautiful poetry that was written and passed down through generations that we still have preserved and, and applicable to us today. Um, after the books of poetry, you have the next two categories are the same thing, but they make up four and five on the five categories. They're the books of prophecy. And the books of prophecy include the first grouping, which we call the major prophets, and the second grouping that we call the minor prophets. And the books of prophecy are really just that. And, and when we talk about prophecy, oftentimes we get this viewpoint that, oh, prophecy is always the telling of the future. The word prophecy just means the declaration of truth. Um, so it doesn't have to be a futuristic event. Oftentimes in the books of prophecy, they were futuristic events. Uh, for example, we, we, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know when the book of Isaiah was written, and he makes a prophecy about a king that wouldn't have been born for 200 more years by name. Um, so we have all throughout the books of prophecy, you see these incredible examples of, of futuristic prophecy, many of which uh, I don't believe have been fulfilled. Um, and we'll talk about some of those things. This, you know, Maybe one day I'll do a course on prophecy, because that's a whole nother study um, that you could just dive into. But the major prophets and the minor prophets are only separated by one thing, and that's the size of the book. It's not that the major prophets are more significant and the minor prophets are um, less significant. It's really just how long the book is. Um, and each of the prophets has their own context and their own people that they're addressing. For example, Isaiah. The whole book of Isaiah is addressing the northern kingdom of Israel predominantly, which was just about to be conquered by the Assyrians. And he foretells of that. Um, he also, Isaiah is what we call one of the messianic prophets. And anytime we use the word messianic, we're talking about someone, something that is referencing the Messiah and the Messiah being Jesus. Um, so messianic prophecies are prophecies about the Messiah. And Isaiah talks a lot about the, the coming Messiah 
and, and is the one that describes a lot of the messianic prophecies that are outlined in the New Testament of being, hey, this was about Jesus. Jesus fulfilled this. Cool beans, man. Um, we will spend a night and talk about the messianic prophecies in the Old Testament and one, the likelihood of them being fulfilled, but also the historicity of why we trust that they were fulfilled. Um, but that's on another night. So whether it be prophets that were foretelling of the judgment that was to come, like Isaiah, like Habakkuk, Habakkuk foretells of the judgment that was coming to the southern kingdom of Judah by the Babylonians. Um, Habakkuk is actually one of my favorite books of the Bible. It literally starts with him crying out to God saying, why, God, do you not hear me when I call to you? Um, and then he goes into all these issues that he sees in society, and, and he's literally questioning God. That's the second verse in the, the prophet Isaiah, uh, Habakkuk. The first verse is the, 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 prophet of the, the book of the prophet of Habakkuk, and the second verse is, why, God, do you not hear me when I call? <laughs> like, dang. Um, it, it's not sugar-coated at all. And it's, again, I think it's just beautiful. He ends up, at the very end of the book of Habakkuk, he ends up going through so many disastrous things that could happen and then concludes with, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Um, it's a phenomenal book. I love it. So those are the major and the minor prophets. Um, so we have messianic prophecies. We also have, um, we call them judgment prophecies, which are things that are to come. We believe many of those things have been fulfilled. Uh, but we also believe that many of those things have not been fulfilled. So there are things that are addressed in the book of Daniel, for example, um, that haven't been fulfilled yet. And they are futuristic prophecies of things that are to come. And there are some things that have been fulfilled that we didn't recognize as being fulfilled, potentially. Um, ultimately, the, the prophecies in themselves, specifically the futuristic prophecies, can sometimes be really hard to understand. Um, and we'll talk about that more when we get to the New Testament prophecies in the book of Revelation. Yes? Where's the split between the uh, major and minor prophets? So the major prophets are... Oh, I didn't do the major and minor on these. So it's Isaiah through, I think, what's right before Joel? Hosea. What's right before Hosea? Daniel. What? Daniel. So it's Isaiah through Daniel, and then you said Hosea. Hosea through Malachi is the break of the major and minor prophets. Um, they are also outlined within that chronologically. So Isaiah is writing about the coming judgment of the northern kingdom of Israel, which was like 300 years before Daniel was writing as the, the southern tribe of Judah, 200 years, excuse me, it was about 200 years. Daniel's writing, and while he is in captivity in Babylon, um, he was a young man, likely a teenager, when the southern kingdom of Judah was taken over by the Babylonians. He was carried away into captivity. And the book of Daniel also outlines some of the history of their captivity. Um, so even within the genres, you'll get elements of other genres. Um, and, and so that's sometimes when you're reading, important to note, uh, very similar to genre in America. Like if you're reading a newspaper article, that's going to have a certain genre tone to it. Whereas if you're reading a dystopia novel, that's going to be a very different genre. Um, genre matters especially when it comes to reading the Bible, because these authors wrote in different genres with different intents. Um, and so even within the, the specific categories of genres, oftentimes there will be other elements of those genres within a book as it is written. Um, like when Daniel's talking about his history in Babylon uh, and other things like that. So any questions on the Old Testament? So it's a little more in-depth than that as far as there are messianic prophecies, there are futuristic prophecies, uh, there's apocalyptic prophecies, so things for the end times, which are also futuristic prophecies, because there are futuristic prophecies that have been fulfilled, and then there's futuristic prophecies that were not yet fulfilled that are apocalyptic, meaning at the end times. So for example, it gets a little cloudy in the book of Joel. He's talking about a locust invasion that is to come. And we believe, uh, at least in my study, and not everyone would agree with me on this um, as far as interpretation, but how I interpret it is this locust invasion is not only symbolic of an actual locust invasion that we can pinpoint in history, because in that region of the world, they have major locust invasions, kind of similar to how on the East Coast right now they have brood X with the cicadas, if you guys have seen that in the news. 
Um, every 17 years, there's a whole bunch of cicadas, which are little like grasshopper, ugly looking things. Apparently they taste nasty. I don't know why someone wanted to figure that out. But every couple decades, you'll have a major locust invasion. There's two they've pinpointed down to what, what Joel was referencing. So in this one prophecy of the, the locust invasion, he's not only talking literally of a locust invasion that happened that we can pinpoint historically and know that it took place, but we also believe that's referencing a futuristic locust invasion that's apocalyptic, where it's actually referencing probably more so symbolically an invasion that would take place in the nation of Israel, which gets murky. Um, God did not spell out everything he was going to do. Many Christians try to speak with authority that we know for sure how the end times are going to happen. We don't have that authority. There are some things that were revealed and there's a lot of things that weren't. Um, and the way that they were revealed. So when we look at prophecy, an analogy that I think really helps. Think of prophecy like how we see the mountains. So here in Colorado, we have a beautiful view of the mountains. And where we're standing here in Colorado Springs, it looks like it's just a flat canvas. In fact, it looks like Pikes Peak is at the very front of the front range. That's how it appears. Um, except on a really clear day where like the light is shining just right and you can see the shadows from the mountain that's in front of Pikes Peak. But it looks like it's all one flat canvas. It turns out there's thousands of miles of mountains behind what we're able to see. Prophecy is very similar. So prophecy, when we're reading it, we read it like that front range of mountains when really we don't understand how far back some of those things may be. Uh, we don't understand which some of those things may be referenced. Um, even the disciples of Jesus Christ, the ones who worked with him in three years of his ministry, after his death, burial, and resurrection, in the book of Acts, they still asked, Lord, are you now going to establish your kingdom and defeat the Romans? <laughs> and, the, and Jesus is like, dude, you guys still just don't get it. Um, three years they had been with him and they still didn't understand those futuristic prophecies because Jesus didn't come to overthrow the Romans. He came to overthrow sin and death. Um, whereas in their mind, the way they saw it was that the Messiah was going to establish his kingdom then, that he was going to defeat the Romans and that they were going to thrive as a people. Um, and God's plan was so much bigger and outside of their understanding. So when it comes to futuristic prophecies, oftentimes people will try to speak with authority where the Bible doesn't give authority. That doesn't mean we can't study, learn, and seek to understand. Um, but we don't have all the answers. That is, that is for sure. Um, in fact, my favorite example of this in the book of Revelation, I think it's chapter 7. John, who is also the author of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and also the Gospel of John, he wrote a lot. Um, huh? All one John, <laughs> fortunately. He was, he was a busy dude as he was not being boiled in oil, but it's fine. Um, he survived that. It's cool. When he was writing Revelation, there's this part where it comes in and he says, um, and then I saw the seven thunders, but I'm not permitted to tell you what those are. We have no idea what the seven thunders were, man. We know that John saw something that was referenced as the seven thunders. That's all we know. Um, so, and, and who knows what else was said that John wasn't permitted to tell us what they meant in futuristic prophecies, let alone the other prophets. So there are things within prophecy that we can pinpoint when they were fulfilled, there are things that I believe will one day be fulfilled, but they won't necessarily be fulfilled the way we think they'll be fulfilled. Cool. It's a great question. Any other questions about prophecy? Awesome. Anything online? Oh, really? They'll come. Because I don't know why. I probably shouldn't say it since it is online, but there's several families who said they would watch online. I mean, they paid, so I have the money anyway. <laughs> anyway. Um, now let's talk about the New Testament. So that's the Old Testament. And just as a reminder, you know, the more you hear things, the more it sticks. The five categories are the Torah, which are the books of the law, the books of history, the books of poetry, and then major and minor prophets. The New Testament is split up in a very similar nature in that it's five categories. The first category is the Gospels. And the Gospels are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Within the Gospels, you have three Gospels that we call the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, and the reason they're called the Synoptic Gospels is because they're very similar in the, the testimony that they give. They tell very similar accounts of Jesus' ministry. They're very similar in kind of their structure. Uh, we'll talk quite a bit about why we trust the Gospels to be accurate. We'll go more into that detail when we talk about the Gospels in the coming weeks. Um, I know I keep giving you a lot of teasers, and I'm sorry, but I got a, some way to keep you coming back, right? But the Gospels outline the life, well, the, the birth, the life, and the ministry, and eventually the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
Um, so two of the Gospels in particular outline his birth. Um, but each of the Gospels outlines and, and focuses on a different nature of who God is. So you have the book of Matthew. Matthew focuses on Jesus as a man, the human element of Jesus. And Matthew, in the first chapter, starts with the genealogy of Jesus. And in his genealogy of Jesus, he's giving the genealogy from... Uh, one of them goes all the way back to Adam. One of them goes from Abraham. Um, but either way, he gives the genealogy from Abraham, who was promised the coming Messiah as a fulfillment of the blessing that would come to the whole world through Abraham's seed, all the way through David, and then from David down to Joseph. And, and his, I'm sorry, to Mary, because Matthew's focused on the human line, which, by the way, um, Joseph and Mary are both descendants of King David. Um, before you get too much in a frenzy, it's like 13 generations, which is perfectly distinct. Um, and I think David was their most common ancestor. There was no one else along the line. But either way, um, Jesus was a descendant of David, not only by birth through Mary, but also by kingly reign through Joseph, who was his adopted father. Um, but Matthew outlines that genealogy. Then you have the book of Luke. And Luke focuses on a totally different element of the nature of Jesus Christ. Uh, Luke focuses on Jesus as king. And as Luke focuses on Jesus as king, he gives a perfectly legitimate defense for the lineage of Jesus in his ability to be king. That's huge. The biggest reason that's huge is because the Old Testament gives pretty distinct prophecies that you have to be able to prove the lineage of Jesus. In the year 70 AD, which was about 40 years after Jesus died, the Romans came in and destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and scattered the Jews. The, the Romans scattered them so good they weren't reestablished until 1948. That was after World War II. The Jews didn't have their own nation or kingdom until 1948. The Romans dispersed them and destroyed the temple. When they destroyed the temple, all the Jewish lineage was lost. There is no one since that time that can prove their Davidic line. No one. It's impossible. We have the record of Jesus as proof of being part of the Davidic line. Um, and that's a big deal. So Luke focuses on Jesus as king. Um, then you have Mark. And Mark literally just like starts randomly in Jesus' ministry and then goes through uh, his crucifixion. But it focuses on Jesus as a servant. And then you have John. And John focuses on Jesus as God. Because we do believe that Jesus was fully man, yet he was fully God. Because that's what the Bible tells us. And the Gospels outline his life. Um, and within that, you have several different situations. Like, for example, um, people will talk about the different accounts of the feeding of the 4,000 to the 5,000. Well, which is it? Uh, hello, it was two different events. Jesus, in one instance, fed 4,000, and in another instance, fed 5,000. It's not a discrepancy. It's two separate events. Um, so it outlines a lot of the miracles that Jesus did and a lot of the teachings of Jesus. Uh, for example, you have both Matthew and Luke that give... Um, Really, Luke gives a synopsis of what we think is likely the Sermon on the Mount, very similar to what Matthew records. But Matthew's version of the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount is much, much longer. Um, so that'd be like, you know, tonight. Let's say, for example, Zeb goes home. And my mom is like, Zeb is my brother, by the way. And my mom is like, hey, how'd it go tonight? What'd you think? And he was like, oh, it was cool. We learned about this. But then someone who's like really fired up about it, like Peter goes home. And he gives like the full synopsis of everything that we talked about. And he takes out his notes. I mean, it'd be a very similar thing. It doesn't mean that they're different accounts. It just means they were given from different perspectives. Zeb might not go into as much detail. It doesn't mean that it's different. Um, but either way, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, focus primarily on the same stories, the same uh, events in the life of Christ. John is pretty unique. Because not only is John unique in the accounts that it gives, he tells a lot of the details the other Gospels don't, but it's also written in a different intent. And that is, it's written cyclically. The other three are written more linearly. Specifically, the, the Gospel of Luke was written by a physician. And he was a man who never met Jesus, but he knew a lot of dudes that did. And not only was he a physician, but he was a Gentile. And Luke wrote a historical account in his study of the life of Christ. So it's linear. It really goes beginning, middle, and end. John is more cyclical, more thematic in how he tells it. 
And so it, he'll tell these events not in order, but in importance and significance to the, the overarching point that he's trying to make. The reason Luke is writing more linearly is because of our next category. So you have the, the first four books of the Bible or the group of the Gospels. That goes into what we call the book of history. Um, because the, the New Testament only has one book of history, and that's the book of Acts. And the book of Acts was also written by Luke, who was a physician, also a phenomenal historian. He cites his sources. He goes into proper detail. He, I mean, he, he did his homework. Um, we don't know a lot about Luke because the Bible doesn't tell us a lot about him because it's mostly him writing. Um, but I'm pretty sure Luke and I would have been like best friends. Uh, like we just would have had very similar ways of thinking. But um, how cool is it one day we might get to meet him? I don't know how that all works, but I think that'd be pretty awesome. So Luke is writing to a guy named Theophilus. Uh, which, by the way, there's historical records of Theophilus not only existing, but existing exactly where Luke says that he is a leader of. It's kind of cool stuff. But he's writing to this friend and trying to persuade him of Jesus Christ and being Savior in the Gospel of Luke. He then writes another work of the history of the Christian church within that first 30-ish years. Um, because it starts, the book of history starts with Jesus' uh, ascension, where after his resurrection, Jesus ascended into heaven. And then it continues for the first nine-ish chapters about the, the ministry of Peter. And Peter's ministry was focused out of Jerusalem. And from there, that's where they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. We're going to spend some time significantly talking about the Trinity. Because the Trinity is one of the most questioned viewpoints of the Christian faith. We get attacked on the Trinity by Mormons. We get attacked on the Trinity by Muslims. We get attacked on the Trinity by, well, basically everybody. Um, even Christians have a hard time groping with this theology of the Trinity. We're going to go into that. But the book of Acts outlines the giving of the Holy Spirit, and then it outlines the growth of the church. So the first nine chapters are focused in Jerusalem. Then it shifts where there's this guy named Saul. And Saul starts this, this massive persecution. And in this massive persecution, um, the, the Christians are dispersed, spread throughout the world. And then as he's going around killing people, he ends up interacting with Jesus, where Jesus appears to him on the road to Damascus. Paul ends up getting saved, well, Saul. His name is then changed to Paul, and he becomes what we call the apostle to the Gentiles. And a Gentile is anyone who's not a Jew. So you have Jews, which is the, the people group of the Jews, of the line and the lineage of Abraham. Those are Israelites today. Um, you can go be a citizen of Israel if you can prove your Jewish heritage, and 23andMe does that really easily. Um, because through DNA, it's really easy to prove your lineage in different ways, right? Because it's 2021, and we can do cool things like that. A Gentile is everybody else. So everyone is one of those two things. You're either a Jew or a Gentile. I'm very much a Gentile. Um, you know, we do a college Bible study group. We've had a couple Jews trickle in, which I always think is so cool. Um, because I can use them as an example. I'm like, this guy's a Jew, and I'm a Gentile. We're made one in Christ, and it's super cool. Sorry, off topic. But... Um, Paul, the, the second part of Acts, which is basically chapters 10 through 27, outlines Paul's ministry. And even within that, Luke is writing for the first section of that, which is about six or seven chapters. Luke is saying, then Paul went, they went here, they went there. All of a sudden there's a shift where it says, we went here, we went there. That shift is because Luke joins the journey. Luke as a physician becomes Paul's personal physician because Paul kept finding himself in all kinds of trouble. Um, he needed a physician, I'll tell you that. Um, that's why I married a nurse, is because I need a physician. So, <laughs> um, And we see that history, but the letter that we have in the book of history was written as a letter to this guy, Theophilus, um, and it outlines that early history. So we have the Gospels, then we have the books of history. Then we have what's called the Epistles, and we're about to take a break, so stick with me for just a few more minutes. We'll finish these categories. And we'll take a break because I know this is a lot, a lot of information. Um, the epistles are letters. So literally the word epistle. So I already said the word apostle. An apostle was a leadership role within the church. And I'll give a defense for what I view that role as um, because there's people and Christians who I, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that we disagree on some of those definitions, right? Um, it doesn't mean one's right or wrong necessarily in the sense of salvation because it's not determined on salvation. But you have an apostle that is a, a leader in the church, and then you have an epistle, it starts with an E, that is a long letter that is written to a group of people. And there's two categories of epistles. 
The epistles are kind of like the prophets in the Old Testament. You have two categories. The first ones are the Pauline epistles. And they're called the Pauline epistles because they're written from Paul to someone. And that starts in the book of Romans and goes through Philemon. Now, the name of the epistle matters also because the book of Romans was Paul's letter to the church at Rome. It was one of his earliest epistles that he wrote. Um, he had never met the people at Rome, but he wrote them a letter. Uh, then you also have like the, the epistle of Galatians, which was Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, which was a city. Phile uh, not Philemon, excuse me, Philippians was written to the people at Philippi. And Paul will say in the first verses, oftentimes, um, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, to the da -da 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 -da, whoever his audience is. Now, as we're studying the Bible, audience matters. Because you have Romans, people in Rome, that are facing different circumstances than people in Philippi. In fact, the book of Philippians is really beyond a theological book where we get some really rich, deep theology. It's also a thank you note. Paul was sitting there in prison, and the church at Philippi donated to him to meet his need. And it was delivered by a guy named uh, Epaphroditus. Not Epaphroditus. Um, shoot, I'm spacing on it. What was the guy's name? The guy in Philippians. It might have been Epaphroditus. So Epaphroditus delivers these goods. He ends up getting really, really sick and almost dies. And then he recovers. And Paul is saying, hey, thank you for your gift. It was used <laughs> in such a great way, so thank you. And then he gives them encouragement. And then he says, hey, I'm sending Epaphroditus back to you. It is Epaphroditus. I can't believe I, anyway. He sends Epaphroditus back to them. That cultural context matters. Because the other important piece of the book of Philippians is in Philippi at that time, to that point, that was the greatest persecution that Christians faced in the world. To that point, it was one of the greatest local persecutions in Philippi. Paul addresses that persecution. Um, but there are also a people that were immensely poor. Because Philippi, you can think of as like Route 66 in the movie Cars. There, it was a bustling city. All of a sudden, there was a, a highway that was built that, that uh, uh, moved people around the city. So all those people that were making money from people traveling there stopped making money, and they were really struggling financially. And we can learn things based on the context of who things are written to. So the first category of the Pauline epistles are written to specific churches. And we oftentimes call those general epistles, meaning those are written to all believers in all places at all times. So the theological truth, though we don't have to thank Epaphroditus for delivering the gift, that's a specific thank you. There's theological truths in the book of Philippians that are applicable to all believers. That includes believers today in America. Those things that are listed apply to us in these epistles. The second group of epistles that Paul wrote are, are to people. They're the people epistles. And within that, you have the pastoral epistles, which were written to Timothy and Titus. And that's a lot of how we get the structure of our church leadership and, and the way the church should run in, a, in history. Churches have been running this way, whether it be in Asia, America, Africa, Europe. The churches from around the world have used those epistles as their structure of how they run. Um, so those are the Pauline epistles. Um, Paul was an awesome writer, so he's cool. But the second group of epistles are the other epistles, and we call them that because they're written by several different people. Uh, the first one of that is the book of Hebrews, and then that goes through Jude. And the reason the book of Hebrews is put at the very front of that is because we don't know who the author of the book of Hebrews is. It might be a Pauline epistle. Um, I'm personally team Apollos, and if you don't know what that means, that's fine. Ask me later. Um, either way, it doesn't really matter. So you have Hebrews through Jude, and Jude was written by Jude. And then you have books like 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John were written from John to his, uh, the people who were under his care. You have 1st and 2nd Peter that were written to address false teaching. So that's that category of epistles. Lastly, you have the book of prophecy. And Revelation was written by John while he was um, not excommunicated, man. Uh, exiled, thank you. While he was exiled on the, the island of Patmos is where he did most of his writing. And this was the last written book or series of books was about 95 AD. Um, so about 60 years after the life of Christ. Um, John wrote these books anywhere between 90 and 95 AD. And he wrote the book of Revelation, which we would consider an apocalyptic book, meaning futuristic events. Um, I don't believe most of the events in Revelation have happened yet. That is my personal persuasion. I've had dear friends that come to different persuasions. 
Um, Because even within that, many of you have heard the terms like amillennial, amillennial, or literally the same thing, pre-millennial, post-millennial, maybe preterist or things you've heard of. Those are all people that come to different interpretations on the prophecies that are given, um, and it doesn't change salvation. We might disagree, but it's also not black and white. Um, So the book of Revelation causes a lot of confusion um, in the sense that it's not spelled out the way we want, and that two reasons for that. One, remember, John writes cyclically. He doesn't write linearly. If we read it from a Westerner's perspective, we want to put everything in a neat linear order because we're Westerners. John doesn't write linearly. He writes cyclically and thematically, which makes it hard for our cultural context to interpret. Um, So anyway, that's why the author and the genre of the Bible matters. And I know that was a lot of detail to go into of why it's broken up this way. We're going to go on a little break here and we'll talk a little bit about... um, different proofs for the Bible that we'll talk about, and um, also how we got our canon of Scripture, because that defense is really important. But I do think it's important, too, as we're defending the Bible, that we know that breakdown. Um, Specifically, talking about the law, I get that question asked all the time. I've been asked probably like seven or eight times. Why is it, and literally it's always the example of, why does the Bible say not to eat crawfish? I don't know why people hearken on like crawfish. Right next to where it says you can't be homosexual. Well, there's answers for that. There's defenses for that. Um... Anyway, so let's go ahead and take about a 10-minute break, and then uh, we'll come back and continue on with this. So feel free to get those drinks in the refrigerator, chips and stuff. Um, Yeah, just leave it running, but I'll come and do it. Hang on one second. I'm going to mute me for people online.
All right, so we're going to go ahead and get back to this. Um, if you're doing your coffee thing, feel free to keep doing that, and uh, we'll just keep rolling. All right, so I know that a lot of the extent that we've done so far is not necessarily a defense of the Bible, but that breakdown of the Bible, which now helps with the defense of the Bible. Um, and I do think that's an important academic study of Scripture uh, to be able to help us better defend what the Bible says. Um, so there's different areas of study we're going to get into when we start to talk about the Bible. I'm going to give a couple of examples tonight, um, and we're going to actually go more in depth into those things because ultimately this entire class is going to be a defense of the Bible, not just on bibliology, um, but what the Bible claims and says, because that's what we believe to be true. Um, so for the first of this, there are several different areas of study we're going to focus on. We can focus on historical study which would include archaeology and cross-referencing historical references. Um, the Bible obviously has intense genres of history. And if it's claiming to be history, that should be verifiable somehow. If it's saying something happened, then there should be evidence that that happened. Um, the, a small example I'll give tonight, uh, up until about 1968, which for us, we're like, okay, that's old. It doesn't really matter anymore. But up until 1968, one of the biggest attacks against the Bible was what's called the Hittite Empire. Because there was seemingly no proof for that this empire, the Bible claimed, was in a certain area in modern-day Turkey. And we, we didn't have any historical reference of it. We didn't have any military history of it. We didn't have any archaeological evidence for it. All of a sudden, in, in the 1960s, I think it was a little earlier than 1968, but it was in the 1960s, they found a Hittite city exactly where the Bible said it would be. And just as big as the Bible said it would be as far as this empire that was there, um, so even in areas where the rest of history hasn't agreed with the Bible, it turns out in every single case, historically, the Bible was correct, which we can do through cross-reference, we can do through archaeological studies, um, and we obviously also take it by faith. So the Bible is a historical book. Um, those genres of history um, we can trust in. So that's going to be an area of study that we're going to spend when we talk about what we call observable sciences, which will be next week. We're going to study a lot of those observable sciences and defenses for those. Um, history will be one of those things that we study. Well, and there's also scientific. And when we say scientific, how that definition is, is science is the use of your senses to observe the universe around us. So the five senses, obviously, we have sight, smell, taste, touch, and hearing? Sound, right? Is that the one I missed? Did I say sound twice? Okay. Um, and using those senses, we're able to observe certain things. We can go outside and see that the sky is blue. Um, we can know by touching something that this table is here. Uh, there's observable evidences in, in the world that we can verify, but there's also claims in the Bible that are scientific. A couple of examples we're going to go through tonight and we'll go through in more detail. Also, as we start to talk about the observable sciences next week, but just kind of a snippet of, if we're going to claim the Bible is true, here's some examples of like, okay, the Bible was true for a long time before society was right on these things. Um, so in Leviticus, which a lot of these are from the law, because again, when we talk about the civil law, it's how a society best functions. So within this, you have in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, for the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Okay, so here's they're making a statement. The life of a creature is in the blood, and then that's translated spiritually to atonement. But as you guys know, and, and everyone has studied this in elementary school in America, George Washington likely died because when he got sick, they leached him. Meaning they put him in a box and they covered him in leeches because they believed when you were sick, your best chances to fight against that where your blood was, they believed was a carrier of disease and you had to be drawn out of your blood. Uh, that was only like 300 years ago, dude. That was after the Enlightenment. Um, 200 years ago. That was only like 200 years ago that people were still letting out blood. The Jews have been practicing the, the wholesome nature, the medical practice of blood because of this statement for thousands of years. Um, because the Bible says thousands of years ago that the life of a creature is in the blood, which is undeniably, verifiably true. Um, if you're about to die, you're usually given blood, not taken away blood. That's a scientific statement that has obviously been proven true. 
Um, you also have the hanging of the earth. Job chapter 26, verse 7. He spreads out the northern skies over the empty space. He suspends the earth over nothing. Um, literally, the earth exists in a vacuum. There is nothing minus the gravitational pull, which is not a physical thing in the sense of an actual rope that is holding us up. The book of Job was likely the first chronological book of the Bible written. It was written before the books of the law. And even as early as that, in the book of Job, it makes a statement that the earth suspends over nothing. We've observed that. I mean, you have the Hubble telescope that takes beautiful pictures of the earth being suspended over nothing. Um, you have the idea of running water. I love this. And I did this in the New King James. Other translations will also translate this as fresh water, and I'll explain why. Um, but running water. So Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13. And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing. Wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water. Then he shall be clean. Check this out. Did you guys know the American Health Association didn't recommend hand washing for the cleanliness of Americans until the 1980s? Um, we had people in this room that was alive when the American Health Association finally was like, oh yeah, we should probably wash our hands with running water. Um, historically, even as early in the Crimean War in the 1850s, um, one of the greatest reasons that people continued to die was because nurses would go and work on a patient and doctors would go and work on a patient. They would then move to another patient spreading bacteria. It was Florence Nightingale um, who was, that's correct, right? Florence Nightingale was the Crimean War nurse. Yeah. She was the first one that said, hey, in between patients, wash your hands. And that reduced the death rate by like 98% or something stupid like that. Um, the Bible said thousands of years ago that the washing of hands with running water is, is what is going to be most beneficial and healthy for the stopping of the spread of disease. That's a scientific statement. Um, the reason that others will translate it as fresh water, do you guys know even animals understand this? When you have animals, and it, watch your dog do this, okay? If you have an animal, very rarely, until they're comfortable with the situation, will they drink out of a standing still water area. Go out on your hike with a dog. Go out on a hike with your dog. Watch the way they drink. Every single time they have an opportunity to go drink at a stream, they find running water. Because running water is cleaner than standing water. Standing water produces bacteria. Um, so when they say fresh water in the other translations, NIV, ESV, the ones that use fresh water, it's because the word is specifically the cleanly moving water. Um, and they just translated that as fresh water. Um, but it's running water is so important for the cleanliness of cleaning off bacteria. Then you also have in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth. Um, I got to stop here for just a second because there's historical, really bad history of, of what we were taught in schools. Sorry, I just hit the mic. Sorry for anyone who heard that. Really bad history. Did you guys know in the thir about 1350, almost 150 years before Columbus sailed the ocean blue, there are college papers that were written describing the circular nature of the earth. When Columbus sailed, not once, nowhere, you cannot find it in history, not once did he say his reason for going or the reason they denied him passage, not once do we ever see that it was because they thought the earth was flat. There were people in history who thought that. By the time of Columbus's life, that was almost entirely a dead viewpoint. We don't see anywhere in history the, the thought that the earth being flat was part of the Christian church's philosophy or, or reason for, you know, whatever, until about 200 years later, you have a guy named Rousseau who hated Christians and wanted to demonize them any way that he could. That's the first time any historian ever claimed that the Christians thought that the earth was flat. The first time. Um, in fact, the reason, because Columbus obviously ended up sailing uh, with the, the Spanish instead of the Italians, because the Italians wouldn't fund it, the historical reason we have documented of this, the reason they gave him, is because they didn't think he'd make it to the landmass. They thought that body of water was too far to travel, because they knew the earth was round, they knew the nature of how astronomy works, and so they knew it was going to be way farther. Columbus just got really freaking lucky there happened to be two continents here. 
If there wasn't North and South America here, Columbus never would have made it across the ocean. Um, and that's just a piece of history that annoys me because like we're taught in schools that Columbus proved the earth was round. There's papers written 100 years before Columbus even lived that describe the earth being round in Christian universities. And bad history just makes me angry. Those are things you can go find, see, and read. Those are historical evidences we can find. The book of Isaiah was written in the 700s B.C. That was 700 plus years before Christ even lived. And he's talking about the circular nature of the earth. Psalms 8, verse 8. The birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim in the paths of the sea. We're going to focus on this a little more when we talk about observable sciences. But literally the guy who found the ocean currents, the, you know, the East Australian current, the EAC from Finding Nemo, he found them because he said, hey, if the Bible says they're there, I'm going to go find them. And then he did. Wow, turns out there's pathways in the sea. David is writing about them. What? Totally rad, totally rad dude. Fist, noggin, dude. <laughs> um, David is writing about these pathways in the sea hundreds and thousands of years before they were ever discovered by modern science. Leviticus chapter 13, verse 46. As long as they have disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone. They must live outside of the camp. Guys, this is their civil law. If someone gets an illness, they are to quarantine themselves away from society to prevent the spread of disease. Now, there's other areas of the law that allow for the provision of their needs. It's not like they're just left there and screwed. But God recognizes that when they're, because, you know, God knows the nature of this fallen world. Um, and part of their civil law is that if someone is sick, quarantine them. Uh, hello, we understand quarantining now better than we did a year and a half ago. Um, you know, the whole world tried to quarantine there for a couple weeks and a couple months. Uh, and it did slow the spread, just like that was the intent when we first started quarantining. The Bible talked about that hundreds and hundreds of years. That was part of the civil law of a nation a thousand years before Christ even walked the earth. Um, and that is a, a <laughs> which by the way, many modern societies haven't done that. And a lot of people have died because they didn't listen to the wisdom that's in the Bible. These are just a couple of examples. I'm going to make a super audacious claim. And I invite anyone who disagrees with me to prove me wrong. There has, the Bible has never made a claim that has been proven untrue. Not a single time. I can't find it on the internet. I can't find it when I talk to people. Whether it be historical, scientific, there has never been an observable claim that the Bible makes that has been proven untrue. Not a single time. Now, people can bring up, obviously, it doesn't mean all the claims of the Bible have been proven true. You can't prove that Jesus Christ rose from the grave. It's not like we can go skip along to, to Israel and see the empty tomb. Although some people say they think that they found it, and that'd be cool. But um, same is true with like Noah's Ark. Um, although they think they found that too. So, I mean, there's, you know, I don't think we need it. Either way, it doesn't mean everything's been proven true. But to this point, 2021, there has never been a claim that the Bible has made that has ever been proven untrue. And that's what we're going to be exploring as we talk about some of the observable evidences next week. We're going to talk about people that the Bible claim existed and then the proofs that they existed. When for decades, people talked about how they didn't exist, including leaders in Rome, nations like the Hittites. Um, historically, the Bible is accurate. Scientifically, the Bible is accurate. And it has never made a claim that had been proven untrue. How cool is that? That we only not only serve a God that is worthy of our faith, but so much so cares about the integrity and accuracy of his revealed word that even the people that wrote about these things thousands of years before they were discovered by quote unquote modern science wrote about things that were true and accurate to the observable nature of the world. That's cool. That is the power of a, an author of the universe who sustains even his word through the centuries. Um, no other book of any kind of religion can even remotely claim that. Not even a little bit. Um, in fact, I mean, there's a lot of claims, of, like, for example, the book of uh, um, the Quran makes, which the Quran just means the writings of the, the holy book for Muslims. And even Muhammad just thought he was a continuation of the prophets. So he believed Moses was a prophet. Um, he believed that Jesus was a prophet. And then he believed that he was a, another prophet 
in this line of good prophets given to individuals. And he came through and um, many claims within the Quran can be proven untrue. Now, Muslims have a defense for that. They have an apologetic for that. But there's claims that have been proven untrue um, because they are not true. The Bible doesn't have that. Um, lately, even, you know, in our own context and society, there's a lot of Mormons. And lately, uh, Willem and I have actually been getting together with some Mormon missionaries, really cool guys. So we've been really able to get to know them and, and talk about different things. But there are certain things that the Book of Mormon claims that's contradictory to what the Bible claims. There's other things that the Book of Mormon claims that not only have been proven untrue or been revealed untrue later by other Mormons, but then also there's not that same sense of accuracy. So as we've met probably about eight, nine times, and they had asked us to go through and listen to, it was a, a, a man who was speaking to a group of people in the 1980s. And they were like, hey, listen to this and tell us your thoughts. So Willem and I listened to it. As we were listening to it, there were in the 35 dates that were listed, because his argument was the history of all these different things uh, match up perfectly with the Mormon church and what they, they believe. Only five of the dates that were listed of about the 30 to 35 were accurate. And he was off by, like, you know, he had mentioned the printing press was invented in the year 1200. Um, it wasn't invented for another 240 years. And, and, you know, and they were all inaccurate. And what that did for us in our conversations, I came back and I said, hey, man, here's this guy. And this is not, this guy is not their revelation. But everything he says is discredited because of his lack of historicity. Because I can go to Google and see every single date that was wrong. And even at the climax, the climax of his argument was right around the time Joseph Smith was born, so was Karl Marx. And, and for the Mormons, apparently, based on what this guy was saying, I have not really spent a lot of time studying this, they consider communists as their, like, big arch enemies. He gave the wrong date for when Karl Marx was born. Karl Marx was born in 1818, and he said 1817. Here's the climax of this guy's presentation, and almost, you know, and so it made everything else he said uncredible or discredible. Um, and, and I fully understand. Um, I say things that are wrong. And that's why I ask people to, to <laughs> fact check me because there are things that I say that are wrong. But there's a big difference between me saying, I think it was in year da 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 da, and this gentleman who had prepared an outline and had written out all these wrong dates. And then at the very end of his argument, he's like, well, we can claim authority that is from God through revelation. And yet his authority on what he can look up in an encyclopedia wasn't even right. So that contributed in our conversation of it. it and they even themselves were like, okay, well, we're not going to use that recording anymore in, in when we talk to people because it discredited the truthfulness of it. The Bible doesn't have that. The Bible in every single way has been proven true. Um, next time with these individuals, we're going to be talking about um, some of the different historical claims the Book of Mormon makes. Um, and within that, they claim things like, for example, two Native American empires that were here in North America. There has never been a shred of evidence that either of those nations existed. Now, very similar to the Hittites, it doesn't mean we won't find evidence one day. Um, but there's no other historical claim that the Book of Mormon makes that has been proven factually accurate. The Bible can't say that. You can't say that about the Bible. The Bible has never made a claim that has been proven untrue ever. That's a huge, huge defense for the reality of Scripture. So we've talked a little bit about the Bible. We're going to talk a little bit about what the Bible teaches. First, we believe that all man has sinned. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everyone has separated themselves from God through sin, through the rebellion of, of His moral law. We believe that what we're deserving of because of our sins is death. Romans 6.23, and this is just the first half of Romans 6.23. I'll bring up the second half here in just a little bit. Um, but the wages of sin is death. Um, I assume most everyone in here who's been watching has had a job. When you have a job every two weeks, what do you get? Money. You get money. You get a paycheck. A wage is what you deserve for what you have done. So if you've worked for two weeks, what you deserve for that is that payment. Well, if you've sinned against the Holy God, what we deserve for that, our wages for that, is eternal separation from God. That's what we deserve for our sin. So all of us in this room have sinned. We are all deserving of that, that death and eternal separation from God. And then we also recognize we are not able to be right with God. Last week, if you haven't watched last week's video, 
Um, this is a series, so I do encourage you, watch all of the videos. They're available on the Facebook page. As soon as we get the time to go and upload them on the Facebook, they'll be available there. I'm sorry, YouTube, they'll be available there. Um, last week, we talked about the three world religions. There's the religion that says there is no God. There's the religion that says we can work our ways to be right with God. And then the third religion, and by the way, every single world religion that has ever been studied can fall into one of those two categories. Um, more details in last week's video. The third religion is the religion that says that, that God worked to make us right with himself. So what the Bible teaches is so contradictory to every other world religion that teaches that we can work our way to be right with God because the Bible says, as it is written, and this is a quote from Isaiah, I believe. I'm sorry. If someone has their footnotes open to this, they can correct me if I'm wrong. There is none righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. In the book of Isaiah, it also says that even our good works are as a filthy rag to God. Like, dang, that doesn't sound like we serve a God who we're able to please with our works. Well, then the Bible goes on to continue to say, oh, I'm sorry, there's another part to that. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Guys, we have all sinned. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all turned away from God in rebellion. None of us are good. None of us are able to work well enough to become right with God. What the Bible teaches is that uh, it doesn't matter how good you may be, you cannot meet the standard that God has. If we're trying to jump to the moon, it doesn't matter if I jump higher, if, if uh, Caitlin jumps higher, if Zeb jumps higher. We are all falling short of that goal of reaching the moon. And that standard of righteousness that God holds is out of our reach. But that's not where the story ends, according to the Bible. According to the Bible, God sought to restore us as his people. It is a work of God that we're able to be saved, not something we can do. Uh, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It's not that we did something that pleased God. It's that God sought to make us right with himself. So he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Um, and then you have John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life or eternal life. Guys, this is a God that is reaching down to bring us into a right relationship with himself. That is an audacious claim that no other religion in the history of human existence has ever made save the Bible. One of the best arguments for the truth of the Bible, it is the only one that's unique. The only one. All right, remember I said I would come back to Romans 6.23, verse part B. So remember, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. A gift isn't something that you earn. When you're one years old on your first birthday and your parents give you birthday gifts, you didn't do anything to earn those gifts, but they gave them to you with their, yeah, really on any of your birthdays, you really didn't do anything to earn those gifts. Christmas, whatever that is, a gift is something that is given freely, no matter what you did. Um, and fortunately, we don't serve a God who, who, if we're in a right relationship with him, who gives us a lump of coal, right? Um, because that gift cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That is a work of God. And that gift is through his saving work that is only given to us by faith. John 14, verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. It is only by belief in Jesus Christ as our Savior, as fully God and fully man, are we able to be right with God. There are those out there who try to claim that Jesus was just a good man, a good example here he's claiming that I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's not just a good example. That is perfection. You can only achieve perfection through deity. And the Bible undeniably claims that Jesus Christ is God. In John chapter 1, the first 14-ish verses, the, the, again, the Gospel of John, written by John, starts out with these words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. 
So what is this word? Well, he comes back and says in verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Undeniably, without argument, John is claiming that Jesus is God. Anything outside of that isn't a true belief in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. That is an audacious claim by the Bible. That's huge. Because not only is it claiming that Jesus is God, it's claiming he has the ability to take our sins, that God is the one that does the work that allows us to be right with him, but then it's also claiming uh, uh, exclusivity, that Jesus is the only way to be right with God. That's a big claim. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Guys, every other world religion, even the ones we talked about tonight, Christianity is the only one that says that it is not by works that we please God. We talked last week about how Muslims believe in the five pillars to become right with God. Um, as I've talked to my friends, who, these Mormon missionaries, uh, what the Book of Mormon teaches is that Jesus being a good example gives us the opportunity to please God with our works. But what the Bible claims that's in complete contradiction to that view is that it is only by faith and that no good works can please God. It is only by the work of His Son. And that is our defense for the Bible. If you are making these claims that are so contradictory to what the Bible claims, only one can be true. Or they can both be wrong. Either way, they can't both be true. For example, Muhammad could not be another revelation of the same prophets of Moses, Jesus, uh, yeah, Moses, Jesus, and then himself. He couldn't have been. Because he said things that were contradictory. The revelation he received was contradictory to the revelation we have in Scripture. Joseph Smith could not have been a prophet from the same God because the revelation he received is different than the revelation we have in Scripture. If that is the case, why do we believe in the Bible over those other revelations? Why do we have defenses for those? And one of the biggest areas of, of the questions that comes up against um, the Bible is translational and, and historicity issues. Well, let's talk about that. Let's, historicity is the, if it's historically accurate. Yeah. Um, let's talk about those because I asked my friends, and I'm, I'm sorry to use this example. I, I dearly care about these two individuals we've been meeting with. Um, so it's fresh on my brain because we get into some really good conversation. And I dearly love these individuals. And if I believe the Bible is true, well, that means I believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That means I don't believe these individuals are, are walking in the way, and the truth, and the life. And since I care about them, I want to give them a defense for why I believe the Bible is overly accurate. So I asked them, and what we're going to prepare for next time is they're going to look into the historicity of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, and we're going to talk about those different elements. Because if they contradict spiritually and they contradict historically, um, one of them is true and one of them is not. So a couple things. What is the Bible? As we talked about, the Bible is a book uh, or a, a compilation of works written by 66 different authors over a 1,500 year period in two and a half, mainly written in two languages, spoken in two and a half. We talked about that earlier. All with one message. Right there, you have the Bible is cohesive, unified, gives the same message of salvation. And then you have these other one-off prophets that are saying they've received revelation. Which, by the way, the revelation given to Muhammad and Joseph Smith is no different than the revelation that was given to the Gnostics. It's no different uh, to the revelation that was given to the Monazites in the year 300, which is what the Nicene Council addressed. It's no different than other revelation that people received that was against the revelation that is in uh, what we have of the Bible. And so when we talk about these different pieces, we also have a defense for the canon of Scripture. Now, the canon of Scripture is just like any other canon. There's a canon for Star Wars. That means what movies and shows and video games are included in what is considered Star Wars. So video games like Jedi Fallen Order 
um, which is a video game that came out a couple years ago, and I kind of played a little bit, and it's, you know, it's fine. But it's canon. It's considered part of the official story of Star Wars. However, they just developed three brand new movies and spent a butt ton of money on it that they decanonized because they were terrible. Um, those movies are no longer included. So how do we get the canon of Scripture? Why do we believe in the 66 books of the Bible that we have today? So let's talk about the Old Testament canon. As I already mentioned earlier, the Old Testament canon is consistent with the Jewish Hebrew Bible. It's all the exact same books. And the historicity of the continuation of accuracy within that has been undeniably proven accurate. When we talk about the Old Testament Hebrew, um, one thing that's really nice about the Hebrew language is it didn't change as much as other languages do throughout the centuries. Um, even the English language in my own lifetime has failed. When I, or has changed, excuse me, not has failed. The English language is still a thing. All right, when I was in high school, thick just meant really strong. All of a sudden, I went on a, a winter retreat with some high school kids, and I called someone, yeah, I was like, my dad is thick. Thick now, see all the high schoolers in here laugh, or, or younger individuals. Thick means something really different now than it did five years ago. It doesn't mean strong anymore. Same is true with even like, all right, in, <laughs> what does the song says? We'll have a gay old time. That doesn't mean we'll have a homosexual great time. It means a happy time. That word throughout history has changed. Hebrew doesn't see as much of that. Undeniably, what we have in the Hebrew canon, and so much so, did you guys know, no one in an academic level questions the historicity or the canon of the Old Testament. You cannot find it. No. Minus the Apocrypha, but we'll talk about the Apocrypha because that is important, and we'll talk about why some include it and others don't. But the Old Testament canon is undeniably been passed on through the Jews and, and kept a standard of accuracy that is undeniable. So much so, if you guys have ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? So the Dead Sea Scrolls are, were likely buried within the area of the Dead Sea, which is a very, very salty sea over in Israel. And the cool thing about it is because of the atmosphere that it creates, it's perfect for preservation. And in the 1920s, there was a, a sheep herder that threw a rock into a cave and broke a jar. Uh, well, that was the single most biggest historical discovery of the 19th century because they found what's called the Dead Sea Scrolls that were there for almost 2,000 years. We believe the Dead Sea Scrolls were hidden by this group called the Essenes. And the Essenes were a group of Jewish leaders. So when it comes to the New Testament, obviously uh, the Bible talks a lot about the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They were two, basically two political parties within Israel. Then there was a group of the Essenes. Kind of think of the Essenes as libertarian. Um, they didn't, they, they thought the whole thing was corrupt. So they were like, you know what, we're going to leave the political system. We're going to come worship God in the wilderness over here. In fact, many people think that John the Baptist was an Essene. The Bible never talks about the Essenes. Um, and it's E-S-S-E-S, -S -E -S, um, Essenes. It's kind of a weird, weird name. The Bible never mentions them, uh, but history has well documented the Essenes. Specifically, several of the books of Isaiah can be dated to 200 years in authorship before the life of Christ. 200 years. The book of Isaiah for the past 2,000 years. And we have almost, we have large chunks of the book of Isaiah specifically. Many other Old Testament books also, but the book of Isaiah is the best example. Check this out. It was buried about 100, 200 years before the life of Christ. It matched up perfectly almost completely word for word with the Hebrew descendants of Isaiah that we have today. Now, oftentimes, and this is something people will point to, in the English language, the order in which you say a word matters. Um, for example, and I can't think of an example off the top of my head. I should have come prepared on that one. But if you say something out of order, and that's, that's one reason why people who speak a Latin language have a hard time, like Spanish. People who speak Spanish natively have a hard time with English because their order of words is different. Um, other languages have a hard time with English because our rules are stupid. Hebrew wasn't that way. Yeah, we have a Hungarian friend in here who's like, yep. <laughs> um, Hebrew was different. Hebrew, one, the order in which the words were presented did not change the meaning or the context. And so if it was boy was tall or tall was boy, the meaning was the same, even if English it isn't. Um, so some of those changes existed 
as far as in, and that was more so not so much in the book of Isaiah. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself in a little bit. The book of Isaiah was almost completely preserved perfectly word for word. Um, we know that the prophecies that were made in the book of Isaiah have been accurately handed down for at least 2,000 years. And there's other manuscripts. And in fact, a month ago, a month and a half ago, they just found more caves of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which contain more proof of the historicity of the Bible. Anyone who claims that the Bible was, the Old Testament was just focused on the Hebrew Bible, anyone who claims that the Old Testament uh, that the Old Testament was corrupted through the centuries, history says otherwise. You cannot claim that the Bible was changed. The Hebrew Bible, it has remained the same. And history overwhelmingly proves it. Because that's what people will say is like, oh yeah, um, you know, Muhammad does talk about how the Bible is right. Joseph Smith talks about how the Bible is right. But they were corrupted and changed. And history says very strongly otherwise. Very strongly. Now let's talk about the New Testament. I love, I love the study of the New Testament. The New Testament canon of Scripture um, was established through what we call a series of councils. Very similar to in the book of Acts, we have what's called the Jerusalem Council, which is where they determine the Gentiles, remember that word that we talked about of anyone who's not a Jew? Most everyone in here, I'm not going to take a show of hands for who's a Jew. Um, I mean, you're welcome to tell me I'm not. <laughs> you are not a Jew. My brother raised his hand for people who are online. Um, you are not a Jew. So they met in this council where the leaders got together because there was a fight. You had what was called Judaizers that believed that the Gentile Christians had to follow the civic and ceremonial law of the Old Testament. And then you had other Christian leaders that said, no, 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 that's not totally true. And that included Peter, Paul, and, and those that are written about in the Bible. They came to a conclusion in the Jerusalem council after meeting and talking about it, giving testimony of what they had seen, including Gentiles receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, that Gentiles were included in the totality of the Christian faith as complete unified brethren, and that we weren't bound to the civil and ceremonial laws. Well, there were other discrepancies that came up in the way people taught things. So, for example, at the Nicene Council, there was a question on the, the nature of Jesus Christ. There were individuals very similar to individuals today who deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Um, and they were considered heretics because they denied the deity of Jesus Christ. So the Nicene Council met around the year 300 um, when Constantine, who was an emperor of Rome, got saved. After he got saved, um, he allowed for Christianity to freely operate within the Roman Empire, which, by the way, caused massive problems for the Persians the Christians in Persia, which at that point, there were more Christians in Persia than there were in Europe. And the Persian empire saw, after it was legalized in Rome, they saw the Persian Christians as spies. So there was a massive, about 30 to 35 year persecution that was way more intense than any persecution we ever saw in Rome in Persia. And the Christians survived. Um, again, I'm getting into the history side. I was a history major in college and I'm very passionate about that side. Um, now I lost my train of thought. Okay, so the Nicene Council gets together. Well, so throughout history, you have different elements of groups that adhere to certain letters and believe in their historicity that don't adhere to others, and it causes a problem. So for example, the question comes up, why do we include in our canon the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, but not the Gospel of Thomas? And these councils came up with criteria. And we have well, well documented historicity of these councils why they included the books that they did and why they disincluded some of the books that they did. And the criteria for this, there was three points of conclusion for the canonicity of the New Testament. Because remember, the Old Testament was established. There wasn't changing that. That was done, good, kaput. The New Testament works were a little more difficult because there hadn't been an established canon to that point. So when they got together, the three questions they asked, the first one was theological cohesion. So it could not disagree with previous revelation, including the revelation of the Hebrew Bible, because they held, obviously, the Hebrew Bible was the revealed word of God. So books like the Gospel of Thomas, um, which is total crap, by the way. Um, basically, it's a compilation of quotes that are attributed to Jesus, saying things like, for a woman to become saved, she has to become a man, clearly contradicts with other... <laughs> clearly contradicts with other uh, areas of Revelation. Plus, we know through history the Gospel of Thomas wasn't written until about 250 years after the life of Christ. Um, but they had to be theologically cohesive. They couldn't disagree with other theological principles. 
They also had to be historical and uh, authorship accountability. The main exam, uh, excuse me, exemption of this is the book of Hebrews, as I've already mentioned. That's one of the only books, and even to this day, there's people who question that whether or not Hebrews should be included in the canon of Scripture. Um, because we don't know who the author was. We don't have as much historicity to defend that. Now, we have a lot of documentation at the time they did. There was a lot of historicity on the book of Hebrews at the time, and it hasn't survived. In other books, it survived overwhelmingly. We'll get to that in just a little bit. Um, but there had to be historical and authorship accountability. Yes, sir. So do you mean that at the time they knew the author and we've lost it, or they didn't know the author? I don't think so, but there was historical accountability to that over the time tran uh, transmission of the text. Because they would have had many, if not all, of the early documents. Yeah. And very similar to how today, uh, for example, my wife and I watched a movie last night. And from the opening scene, I knew it was produced in the 90s. Because it was very clearly produced in the 90s. It was that neon flashing colors. And, and all the clothes in the first scene were clearly 90s clothes. You can do the same thing with books. Um, you can look at text and, and study and determine when it was produced both by how it was produced, because culturally that changes. Uh, for example, if you find a book that was clearly written on a printer and not typed on a typewriter, that means it had to have been produced after the time the printer was produced or, or made. The same is true with handwriting and other transmissions of texts. At that time, they had a lot more of those original documents than we have surviving today. So that's what I mean by that. I don't think they knew who the author was. At least we don't have documented they knew who the author was. They probably would have said who they thought the author was. Again, I'm still team Apollos, but talk to me about it later. So that's the second criteria they went through. The third criteria that they went through is a general consensus of the council based on historical use. So yeah, the council had to agree. Basically, they got together and they had a vote. Like, do we believe that this is part of the canon of God's word? Now, one thing we have to remember these are Christians that are coming out of a major Roman persecution. Christianity had just been legalized. And think about it culturally. Here are a bunch of Christian men that had just been killed by Constantine's people. All of a sudden, Constantine is like, hey, I want to bring unity to the Christian church. He invites all these Christians. Could you imagine going to that conference and being like, uh, this is terrifying. They had literally just spent their entire lives defying the emperor. And now they were guests at the emperor's place. I don't know if it was the palace, but wherever Nicaea met, you know, they were guests of the emperor. Now check this out. This is well historically documented. Constantine left. He wasn't present in the decisions that were made in the Nicaean council, and then later councils that also determined the canon of scripture. Most of our canon of scripture was isol or, uh, determined at that point, and, and oftentimes what's brought up as an argument is, oh, Constantine just included what he wanted. There is no historical proof of that. What we have is extensive writings of Christian leaders who we know had spent their lives going against the emperor. They're not going to follow after the emperor just because he says he's a Christian. There was strong mistrust of Christians as they were going to that council of the emperor. Document it. So these Christian leaders loved God. They valued the scriptures during their time of their lives being threatened. That's what they held on to for their hope. And they're not going to allow, they weren't going to allow for false doctrine, false scriptures to come into the canon of scripture that we ultimately end up having today that is not the council where the verses and chapters were implemented that was later on down the road um the nicene council is well documented and, and historicity proves that it was a, a one well conducted council and two that it was lacking in in bias now like everyone they had biases and part of their biases was they were trying to disprove a false teaching that had come into the church. And because of that, they were holding fast to what do we hold as scripture? Um, later on, there were other areas of, of questioning, specifically on the Apocrypha. And the Apocrypha are 14 books that were not included in the Jewish Bible specifically. And then some of the later writings that were not included in the New Testament are included in the Apocrypha. Those 14 books in the Jewish Bible, so you have the Jewish Hebrew Bible, well, after their dispersion, specifically at the hands of the Assyrians and the Babylonians, Jews were spread all over the world, and there had developed a Greek translation of the Bible. The Apocrypha 
uh, um, is from what we call the Septuagint. And the Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. It included those 14 books. And because um, those 14 books were not part of the Hebrew Bible, and even Jews don't consider them canon, um, that's why they were excluded in the canon, even though one of them is quoted in the book of Jude. Because Jude is writing to a Greek audience. And if he's writing to a Greek audience, they would have known the book of Enoch specifically, the prophet of Enoch, and he quotes one of those books in the Apocrypha. Um, but that's why they were excluded from the canon that we have today. Um, and then later on, there were, there were some New Testament books, including there's like an Apocrypha, uh, a book from the Apocrypha that like claims that Jesus killed a dude when he was a kid and then rose him from the dead because his mom got him in trouble and stuff like that. But other areas, so we laugh at that because it's kind of ridiculous, but there's other areas of theological discrepancies very similar to how we've, we've not included lots of books of Revelation because they disagree theologically. We don't believe they were sound in the way that they received Revelation, um, including, like I've already mentioned, uh, the Quran and the Book of Mormon are two examples, but there's lots of examples of ones that we've excluded from the canon besides the Apocrypha because of theological lack of cohesion. Um, any questions on that? Yeah, go ahead. Correct. Um, so and that's not where the canon was fully established, but that was an area where they really uh, excluded specifically some of the books of the Apocrypha and started to develop the official 66 book canon we have today. Okay. So with that, um, there's a lot of traditions that go along with like, the 19th century. Mm -hmm. All right, how do I answer like a four hour thing in like two minutes? Um, long story short, when we study the history of the Catholic Church, we don't see many of the areas in which case we believe that they are wrong in their interpretation until about a thousand plus years after the life of Christ. So for example, the Catholic doctrine of praying to Mary. We don't see any evidence of that in history until about the year 1000 to 1280, somewhere in there. Same with like in indulgences. We don't see that until like 1095. Um, so those areas of, of disagreement are things that came along much later. So when we talk about the Catholic Church, even the reformers, for example, Martin Luther had zero intention of leaving the Catholic Church. He believed in the church. And then he brought up some things. He's like, hey, maybe we're not right on this. And part of that was through a resurgence of studying Greek. So even, for example, in the Vulgate translation of the Bible, it's the Latin translation. It was translated in about the year 400, somewhere in there. Um, there are some things that got really, really wrong as far as small translational differences. So, for example, um, when you have Gabriel appearing to Mary, the translations that we have would say, um, blessed are you amongst women. The Vulgate translation in Latin translated it more eccentrically, where it translated it more as like, um, magnificent are you amongst women. And that led to the eventual discrepancy where, where people started to pray to Mary, which also came around through more culturally of the thought of like, hey, when I want someone to do something, I ask their mom um, because their mom has persuasion and power over them. And people thought that Mary, as Jesus's mom, had power and persuasion over Jesus. So if I pray to Mary, Jesus is more likely to hear me. That ended up becoming tradition within the Catholic Church as opposed to scripture within the Catholic Church. Protestants that came out of the Protestant Reformation do not hold to tradition as a means of revelation. Um, Catholics, as, as they're called, obviously now still today, Roman Catholics, still do hold to tradition as means of revelation, as, as things we've done it for a long time, so we think it's correct. But even within the Catholic Church, there's been so many, honestly, amazing Reformation movements, including in the 1960s. So just here recently, they have what's called Vatican II, in which, in which go look up the Vatican II, they actually go through and reform many of the Catholic beliefs Granted, it took 400 years after the time of Martin Luther for them to really come to that conclusion. And there are certain things they held to. Um, so where I kind of stand on that specifically, um, we cannot be the judges of who has saving faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, for example, um, since we talked about it a lot tonight, you have a Mormon church that teaches it's another denomination of Christianity. 
And they, they do. They claim to teach Jesus Christ. Now, I fully believe that someone who claims to be a Mormon can have saving faith in Jesus as the Messiah, um, even though the Mormon holy books don't teach that. Um, and specifically, the Mormon church doesn't start to teach that until the higher levels of education within the Mormon church. Um, because ever since about the 1980s, whenever, or 2000 actually, it was the year 2000, um, that the Olympics were in Salt Lake City, all of a sudden the Mormons went from saying, we're definitely not a denomination of Christians to, hey, we're another denomination of Christians to make it a little more streamlined since the whole world was watching Salt Lake City. Um, so I have no doubt that if someone who has saving faith in Jesus Christ, even though they claim the name Mormon, that they'll be in heaven. Same is true, and I would say more so with Catholics um, because there's certain things that I strongly disagree on with Catholics um, for example, I do think that praying to Mary is not just wrong, but it's idolatrous. But is that bearing on salvation? I can't be the judge of that. Because if they still have faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ, even with a bad interpretation, that doesn't mean they're not saved. And I can't be the one that judges that. So back to your original question. Um, the Catholic Church up to that point, especially at the Nicene Council, the word Catholic just means universal. And at that point, it included, in fact, most of the representatives in the Nicene Council were North African. North Africa and Syria was the focal point of the Christian movement up until about the year 750 when there was a Muslim invasion. And Christianity remained dominant in those areas even until today. So you have what's called the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Even though Muslims ruled politically and tried to stomp out Christianity, they didn't. And so when you say the word Catholic, it just means universal. So I would not at all say that the Nicene Council... Um, is, is in line with the false doctrines of the Catholic Church. And so, I mean, I adhere to it. And I think, you know, I mean, there's some really very Catholic authors. Um, Augustine, for example. And I think he has some great works. Um, Aquinas, Origen. These are people I may not agree with everything. I don't agree with everything that Martin Luther taught. Martin Luther sanctioned the killing of people who believed in adult baptism. Um, because infant baptism was the way the church had always done it. I mean, even up until the first century, or since the first century, we can see historically. Uh, so all of a sudden, you have these Anabaptists running around that are like, hey, we should probably wait until we're adults to baptize people. And then Martin Luther's like, no, that's wrong. And he started killing them. So obviously, um, we don't agree with everyone on everything. Um, but in regards to the Catholic Church and some of those discrepancies, um, one, as I've kind of grown and studied, I see them as less, most, all of those areas are not salvific because just like there are some Catholic teachers that teach that it's by works that you please God, but there's a lot of Protestant preachers that preach that too. And anyone who uses the Bible can come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Um, in the 1960s, there started to be a movement called, it's uh, the church of Christ movement actually is what I think it's called. And it was a strong movement. So that'd be Church of Christ churches, Assemblies of God, um, that denomination that they were like, we're going to go back to a Bible first only viewpoint. So they don't use any of the creeds. Um, the creeds are not at all revelation. They are not scripture. But they're summaries of scripture that help us to better understand God and tools that are used for that. And as long as they use scripture for that, I have no problem with that. Um, and, you know, part of that movement is they started to teach that unless you were baptized, you couldn't be saved. And I don't agree with that. I mean, even the, the um, criminal on the cross, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. It's not like he got off the cross and got baptized. Um, <laughs> all the Romans are like, hold up, dude. Like, what are you doing? Hold up. <laughs> now, I think people who are in the assemblies of God's nomination, if they have saving faith in Jesus Christ, though I disagree with them on some things, they'll be in heaven. Um, because those, those issues do not bear on salvation. Same is true with many of the things in the Nicene Creed. So that's where that movement kind of started, specifically of the rejection of the Nicene Creed um, and, and some of those other creedal movements that happened. Um, for Protestant churches, which we're in, obviously there was another creed of the Council of Trent, which happened about 40 years after Martin Luther posted the 95 Theses. We don't hold to that, the creeds that were given at the Council of Trent um, because they adhered to all the things that Martin Luther was like, I don't think I agree with this. So... Part of that is studying and understanding history and really seeing where people got off on those things. So I know we're running late. I only have a couple more things. Is everyone willing to stay with me just for a few minutes? If not, feel free to leave. It's not like I'm holding you hostage. Um, but if I save this till next week, it's not going to make sense. So 
as we keep studying bibliology, you have some attacks that are against the Bible. One of the big things that comes up are apparent contradictions. Guys, there's only a handful. And forgive me, but people are really scraping the bottom of the barrel on these. I searched and searched and searched for accusations of contradictions in the Bible. And not only are there not any good ones presented, uh, but even the people that write on them are like, you know what, I'm just trying my best to find a discrepancy. This is all I got. Like, I read articles that literally said things like that. Um, here are some examples. So you have the resurrection account, some of the things that people question at the time of day, the number of women that were present and the number of angels that were present. Uh, so, for example, one of the, the gospels says that at first light and another gospel says at a different time, um, ultimately, the way that it describes it could be, one, the exact same way to describe two different things. Hey, I'll see you at 12 o'clock or I'll see you at noon. Yeah, those are two different things, and, but they're the exact same thing. Or it could also be that, yeah, maybe he got the time wrong. Um, if you said the apologetics class starts at 6 o'clock, well, we started tonight at like 6.07. That's why we're going late. It's because people were late. So I have, you know, freedom to go a little late, right? The other big one is the number of women and the number of angels that were present. Like, these are literally the best examples that I could find of contradictions in the Bible. Again, if Zeb goes home, and Zeb is, my mom is like, hey, who was all there? And he'll be like, oh, you know, Caroline, Brandon, some other people. Cool. If Peter goes home and he's super amped up on it, he's like, oh, I took a list. There was Willem and Jacob and Caitlin and Zeb, and he lists everybody. That doesn't mean Zeb's account is wrong. And just because he doesn't list everybody doesn't mean those people weren't there. Same is true with the angels. The Bible doesn't say that there was absolutely only one angel and there were no other angels present. It says the women came upon an angel. They did. There was an angel present. Hello? It doesn't mean there weren't three or four angels present, but there was definitely an angel present. Um, so a lot of it is conjecture and trying to read into the text to really scrape at the bottom of the barrel to find a discrepancy. And those are just some examples. The other one is the robe color of Jesus was wearing in the gospel accounts. Um, one thing to recognize is you read the gospel accounts there at two different times. One says that it's a red robe and the other says that it's a purple robe or, or something along those lines. Uh, well, yeah, if someone's talking about, well, yeah, well, that could be part of it, but I think it's more this. If you're describing what Jesus was wearing at the beginning of his arrest, it was a purple robe. If you're describing what Jesus was wearing at the end of the night, it was a red robe. Yeah. Um, kind of like when you stick a white shirt into a dryer with a pink sock. Colors can change really easily. Um, and depending on when that individual observed Jesus' robe, it could have been two very, very different colors. The colorblind thing is actually an argument people bring up. It's like, we don't know they weren't colorblind. Because that could be very true. Actually, I think, are, is there anyone in here that's colorblind? Okay, so sometimes you see colors that are a little bit different. Um, and so, again, I, that's just kind of really, really where people are kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel. Here's the key when we're talking about the Bible. Context, context, context. In 2018, I went to Uganda, and there were about 1,000 kids at this youth conference that we hosted. We're planning on doing a youth conference in December um, that's actually all the money that's donated for this class is going towards that Uganda conference. And we're expecting about 600 kids because they have COVID restrictions. Man, we're really praying. We're saying, God, please allow for those restrictions to change. If, I, if someone goes and writes an article of the testimony of my life and they write that there was a conference with 1,000 kids, but someone tries to correlate that with that being the December of 2021 conference, yeah, they'll be wrong. But context matters. If I'm writing a letter to my wife and I'm talking about the love that I have for my wife and it's read by my brother, it's going to mean something different. The love that I have for my brother is very different than the love that I have for my wife, even if I love them both so, so much. To give an example of this, there was one time I was trying to text Zeb. My dog had gone and gotten spayed or neutered, whichever they do to the female. Um, and I went to go text Zeb in my phone. I said, hey, can you help me pick up May and then we'll go out to dinner after. There was someone who just started working at our church, and her name was Zoe Anderson. Um, and we were friends in middle school, but we hadn't really talked since then. It was like her first week working at the church. Instead of texting Zeb Anderson, I texted Zoe Anderson. So here I am accidentally asking out our new worship director at the church. Um, and so I get a text back, who's May? I'm like, come on, idiot. You know who May is. Like, <laughs> um, it wasn't that harsh. But context matters. Who I am speaking to matters. Because I wasn't asking out Zoe. I was trying to get my brother to help me out with something. 
Um, context matters. Same is true in the Bible. The context of who it is written to and what it's written for matters to the meaning of it. For example, in the book of Philippians, Paul says, for I am bound in the chains of Christ. I've had people come back and they've said, you know what? We're all supposed to be in spiritual chains for Christ. I'm like, okay, that might be a good example or conclusion, but Paul's not talking about spiritual chains. Paul literally was arrested in Jerusalem and held in prison waiting trial in Rome when he wrote the letter of Philippians. That context matters. Context, context, context. Um, and those are just some of the examples of discrepancies. And again, I just, they're just not great. <laughs> I'm not trying to sound rude, but man, they are really scraping the bottom of the barrel of those claims. The other big one people bring up is translational issues. When you have translational issues, yeah, that can sometimes change meaning. Did you guys know though that there is no translational issue that has changed the essentials of salvation that we can really see anywhere in the world? I already brought up the translational issue with the Vulgate, and that did change some of the theology that the Catholic Church held to, but it's not bearing on salvation if they still believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Um, there's areas of the world where the translation of the Bible changes words, like for example, um, where the Bible talks about us being as clean as snow. There are some cultures that have never seen snow. That means nothing to them. So the translators change the word snow into like a sand substance that that culture would understand. That doesn't change the meaning. And we talk about the historicity and the proof of Scripture. When people talk about the New Testament canon and the issues that it has, check this out. Do you know that the New Testament Bible has more than 5,500 surviving early manuscripts of the original language? 5,500. That is first place on the books of antiquity by almost 5,000. The second place contender on the books of antiquity with original documents that exist is the Iliad. And the Iliad only has 650. The Bible has 5,500 early Greek manuscripts, some we believe to be within 30 years of its original writing in some of the books of John. And we can place them there, meaning if they were corrupted, it was within 30 years of when John wrote it. And the likelihood of that is small, <laughs> really just impossible. And even people who don't believe in the Bible will concede it's very, very historically unlikely that it was corrupted in any way. 5,500, beyond that, within the first 500 years. This is the first 500 years of the authorship of the New Testament that we have existing, surviving. You can go find these, read these, test these. 24,000 copies of the New Testament, not the full New Testament, but manuscripts of things in the New Testament written in other languages. Translations into Latin, translations into Greek, translations into Hebrew for the Greek translation, translations into different African, Syrian, Persian translations, 24,000, all of which have cohesion, all of which maintain the same message, all of which are verifiably, historically proven to be originals to what they were, which is within the first 500 years of Christianity, we have something like 30,000 manuscripts that prove the historicity of the Bible. Beyond that, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've also found other things that prove some of the historicity of the individuals that are claimed. For example, um, the book of John has different areas that have been proven more historically accurate through the Dead Sea Scrolls. Things that were long times claimed to be, oh, that can't be true, it must have been corrupted. All of a sudden we're like, uh, it wasn't corrupted. This is true and accurate. So that's why I asked my Mormon friends that I've been meeting with, go find examples. If you're claiming that the Bible has been corrupted, I have 30,000, 30,000 documents that say otherwise. Show me your evidence. And, and I'm sorry, but Joseph Smith told me so isn't enough. Um, 30,000 documents, that's a lot. Greater than any other book of antiquity. Um, and the fact that we have those 5,500 in the, the, the original Greek language is just insurmountable as far as any kind of claims that the Bible has been corrupted or changed. Um, and again, all the examples of the change that we see are things like the switching of words that don't matter in the language, or for example, what they'll count, uh, let's say there's a sentence and in 2000 of the documents, there's no comma. 
it wouldn't be a comma, but whatever they used, it was similar to a comma, which again changes the meaning a lot more in English than it does in Greek. They count that as 2,000 discrepancies. All right, you can count it as a discrepancy. It doesn't, uh, it's not a discrepancy in the meaning. It doesn't change the way that the Bible was handed down. Now, here's the reality of the Bible. The reality is this, that you have almost 40 authors over a 1,500-year period with two different languages, countless backgrounds culturally, nationally. And those individuals wrote a cohesive work of revelation from God that has not only withstood the test of time, but it also is something that we can not only put our faith in historically, scientifically, um, that we have examples of how it's beyond a shadow of a doubt existed any corruption that people try to claim that it has. And there's no, and we have those manuscripts go point to where those theological discrepancies are. If you think they exist, show me. I don't mind that criticism. Let's talk about it. But they don't have it. Because ultimately what we believe is that all Scripture is God-breathed. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be, full, uh, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work as we seek to serve God. Remember context. This was written in 2 Timothy. Timothy is what we call a pastoral epistle. Paul is writing to Timothy on how to read the, lead the church. And he's saying, Scripture was given by God and is profitable for our lives today. And that is no different 2,000 years ago than it is today. The Bible is true. The Bible is working. The Bible is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. And if we can trust in it for its historicity, its scientific paralysis, and all these other things, I believe we can trust in it with our lives. And not only because of all these proofs, but because it was inspired by God. Does anybody have any questions on those things? Wow, I went really late. I'm so sorry, guys. I'll try to be better on the time thing. Any questions on uh, some of the bibliology that we talked about tonight? Cool. Well, we're going to close in prayer. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking a lot about observable sciences. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it just because... When I was a kid, evolution was one of the biggest attacks against the church. That's changed. That's really not a reality anymore. In my entire time of ministry, not a single time has it been brought up um, evolution as an argument against the existence of God. So we'll talk about some of those things, but that's not going to be a focus of this apologetics class, just because culturally, um, I'll get into all that next week. Let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much that you have not only revealed yourself to us, but that you have preserved and maintained your revelation. And we know that it is true and accurate. And God, we know that any false teachings that come against it um, will not be able to stand, just like many false teachings have come against your word, both in the time of John as he's rebu uh, rebuking the Gnostics that spoke false truth, or, or whether it be individuals today that, that deny Jesus as Lord. God, we just thank you that we can know and trust in the Bible as our source of revelation. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. You can stop the stream. Cool. All right, feel free to hang out, chill, get to know someone.